Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe after uh, Hugh's talk, I should have named this uh, Show Me a Model. Uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, but I also want to thank uh, uh, Matt Farr and, and Hugh for organizing this all-important uh, conference, and uh, very much looking forward to it. Uh, insert retrocausal joke here. It's, it's been great. Thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to try to get into a little more detail of what a specific retrocausal account of these entanglement scenarios might look like. Um, and the, the big motivation I have is um, a certain kind of locality. Basically, I see retrocausal explanations as the only way to possibly rescue having the beables live in ordinary space-time. I actually have everything that is ontological about our universe actually associated with points on our space-time manifold. And um, this is often uh, thought of as an impossible task, so part of my job is to can try to convince you it's not impossible. But I think it's relatively obvious why this would be fantastic for physics in general if this were true. I mean, as far as certainly bringing uh, Lorentz invariance relativity and quantum theory into a lot more harmony than they currently are, just simply having beables that live in space-time would be a, a fantastic step forward. And so however hard this task might be, it's, it's, worth, it's worth pursuing. Um, but uh, we're not going to just build it from standard multi-particle multi wave functions. So you can't just add retrocausality to something that doesn't uh, live in space-time to begin with and end up with something that lives in space-time. Uh, and at least, I mean, I guess we are probably going to hear talks about retrocausal accounts in configuration space, but that is not at all what I'm concerned with. Uh, if, if I'm going to get to this point of having all the beables in space-time, then I have to view this as an epistemic uh, set of information, perhaps on um, par with uh, configuration space states in thermodynamics, where there is a something underneath. And so we're going to try to drill down and figure out if there is something hiding underneath here that could be some ontology that would be fully based in space-time. Now, there, uh, Hugh has nicely outlined two motivations for this. Um, you can uh, motivate it with, with the no-go theorems. The problem with that is, uh, while it's, the, I think, the best motivation for retrocausality, it's a poor uh, guide to building a specific model, especially since we can't just start with regular quantum mechanics and work from there. We have to dig beneath it. We're going to need some better guidance. Uh, but the other um, motivation he mentioned, time symmetry, that is an enormous uh, guidance. And it's going to guide pretty much every, every decision point that comes up. It's going to be guided by, is the result going to be time symmetric or not? And uh, that is, I think, is a key guiding principle for going down this line. Of course, you, you don't have to go take this as a guiding principle, but that's, that's my uh, starting assumption. Try to get to the point where we can get uh, quantum states, or not quantum states, we can get some beables back only in space-time. So basically, I'm going to start out with a lot of the key decision points on uh, building a model and, and how to implement things. Uh, the first one is measurements, and time symmetry is extremely useful here. It basically tells you that uh, measurements are just kind of almost exactly like time reverses preparation, with the exception that we already heard Hugh talk about, that uh, the reason he had to introduce the demon on the left is that uh, we external agents can control the input to a preparation, but we can't control the outcome to a measurement. Notice the uh, asymmetry comes in here at the level of the agent, where there may be uh, uh, statistical thermodynamic considerations. But uh, by the time you zoom down to the phenomena we're talking about, few particle entanglement, the microscopic description of it, uh, the apparent T asymmetries go away, and uh, we have time symmetry, as best we know, is a very important feature of, of physics uh, on that scale. So I don't want to add any, any time asymmetries. This is coming in at the level of the agent, and we can talk about where that matters in a little bit. OK, so preparation is pretty straightforward. We uh, have some free choice of setting. And then uh, we imagine that after that preparation, there are future beables, and we know instinctively how to do this mathematically. We just impose any uh, preparation we do as a boundary condition on any, any beables that come later. This almost goes without saying we do this without even thinking about it. Uh, time symmetry, though, says if we're going to treat measurement as the time reverse of this, uh, looks very unusual. 
Now we still have this free choice of setting coming from outside the system of, of interest, but now it's constraining past people. So it's really counterintuitive to actually have a final boundary condition on, on these beables. Mathematically, we can do it. We can impose a final boundary condition on, on whatever is happening down here, but this is unusual. This is where the, the retrocausality comes in, in that, uh, like Hugh said, you have to reach in and make some intervention, and then if that intervention, depending on what you choose, is correlated with uh, some, something that happens in the past, that's, that's retrocausality. And of course, this, this uh, imposing a future boundary condition based on a free choice of setting is going to get us through the no-go theorems. And we'll see explicitly in some of the models exactly how that works. And we can sort of zoom in on exactly what the quote-unquote uh, weird stuff is as far as retrocausality here. <clears throat> One thing I want to stress, though, is that you can't change the past, right? In a, uh, in, if all the beables live in space-time, then at some x, y, z, t point in, and in space-time, that there, that beable will have one value. You can't, uh, you don't want to analyze it going forward and then backward and suddenly decide, oh, I've changed the past. That doesn't even logically make any sense. Change requires another time variable. So at any point in space-time, the beables are what they are. Uh, and because of this, this problem we have of even thinking in terms of zigzags, forward and backward, it's actually much safer when actually building these models, instead of thinking dynamically, to think about the whole history all at once. Make sure you have a nice, consistent story, and you don't have two different values at the same beable at the same point in space-time, which doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> OK, so that is uh, how I'm going to implement measurements, basically as boundary conditions on uh, the prior uh, beables in the system. Uh, well, OK, that, that brings the question of what happens in between now. What, what do we do about dynamics? Now, even aside from this configuration space issue, the Schrodinger equation is not auspicious for implementing initial and final boundary conditions because it's a first-order differential equation. You give it an initial state, and you know everything. You can't give it a final boundary condition without over-constraining. Um, so uh, this is not promising for imposing a final boundary. But there are options. So um, one option would be to basically double the Schrodinger equation. You have two sets of equations. Uh, and perhaps have the preparation constraint one of them and the measurement constraint the other one. And this is basically what we'll be hearing a lot about tomorrow in uh, the two-state uh, formulas. One interesting slash weird thing about this is that notice your preparation is on one of these two sets of equations and then your measurement is on the other one. You, you kind of have to switch back and forth because uh, if your initial preparation is on one wave function and then your next measurement is on a totally different wave function, your, what you're seeing is moving back and forth, and the other one is always invisible. Uh, the fact that one of them is always invisible has kind of bothered me. And so at first, my approach was, well, we just need a more interesting equation. We need a second order equation, which in turn might be also motivated by, by relativity. Uh, you get a second order equation. Now there is, mathematically anyway, room to impose both boundary conditions. But uh, I worked on this for many years, and uh, this, if you want to see how far you can get, you can check out my old Klein-Gordon paper. But there are generally still problems with finding solutions to a two-boundary problem imposed even on second-order differential equations. Um, but one thing that always struck me as I was working on this was the similarity uh, of what I was doing to variational principles and path integrals in that um, that's what you do in the variational principle. You impose a partial initial boundary a partial final boundary, and then you're looking at a two-time boundary constraint problem. And so that was always kind of in the back of my mind as maybe I should be looking more heavily at this. And so in the last few years, I fully switched over. And so the, the proposal I'm, I'm going to follow here is to get rid of law-like dynamic equations and drop back a little. I mean, where do, where do these equations come from in the first place? Uh, in classical physics, they come from uh, action extremization. Of, of a Lagrangian, you get the Euler-Lagrange equations. But quantum mechanics tells us that's actually just an approximation. The whole, gener uh, ge uh, the whole action extremization is just an h-bar goes to zero approximation. So maybe uh, we shouldn't be having these law-like differential equations. Or maybe we should drop back to uh, a sort of a pre-dynamic uh, frame. Um, after all, when you do the path integral, or variational principles for that matter, you're looking at all sorts of crazy paths, right? You're looking at paths that don't necessarily follow any particular set of dynamic equations. And 
One thing that I, I quite like about this, well, it's good and bad things, but if you all you're constraining is the initial state and the final state and looking at a whole array of intermediate possibilities, while that might be might not be too crazy, and we'll get back to that, um, you're naturally going to get probabilities. As soon as there's something you don't know, I don't know what happened between these two boundaries, you get probabilities out quite naturally in that if you say, well, there is one history, one, one micro history that happened in between, but I don't know which one, there's at least room to find probabilities in a very natural way. <clears throat> and that brings us to the last part of implementation, uh, probabilities. Uh, a lot of people go down the road of changing probability theory in some way. I, I see that as a competitor to retrocausal stories. Um, and I certainly think at this stage, it's important to keep them separate. Like you can do research where you change probability theory, you can do research where you have retrocausality, but mixing the two seems to me, uh, even if it got to a great result, you wouldn't know which one was, was really getting you what you wanted. And I'm gonna argue that you don't need to change probability theory uh, if, if you have the retrocausal story. <clears throat> now what we're not looking for is some fundamental derivation of conditional probabilities. Conditional probabilities, you know, given the past, what's the probability of the future, that is itself kind of a time, time asymmetric uh, story. And really, actually, if you look to the path interval, it's far more naturally interpreted as joint probabilities between past and future. So sometimes scattering probabilities, uh, the S matrix story of quantum field theory, where you're just looking at the joint probability between an initial state and a final state. So for example, um, don't worry about the details, but one version of the uh, propagator combined with the Born rule that gives you the joint probabilities between your two measured uh, initial and final measured outcomes. Uh, there's no difference between the past and future. It's perfectly time symmetric on this side, so it would be very unnatural to make it asymmetric on this side, to make this a conditional probability. It's far more natural to think of these as joint probabilities, and so all the probabilities I'm going to be talking about here are joint. Uh, and once you have all the joint probabilities, you can get the Born rule. And you can test it to see if it's working. You can get all your conditional probabilities using just standard probability theory. Um, but these don't have to be fundamental. It's, it's perhaps these guys that are fundamental. And of course, this is what we do in StatMech. You divide by the partition function to make sure everything's normalized. And in StatMech, um, there's one unknown microstate that maybe you never find out what it is. Uh, you can hope that if you're doing this retrocausal story in space-time, that you might find one unknown microhistory might be the one that really happens, even if we never find out quite which one it is. Um, there are a lot of analogies to StatMech that I'll be, I'll be referring to. So that's, that's basically the way I'm, I'm looking at probabilities. The upshot of the slide is that I'm looking for joint probabilities, not, uh, not conditional ones. Okay, so with that out of the way, now it's time to start building a model. Um, and the most useful uh, tool we found, you've already seen, seen a version of it, um, and this is uh, work done with uh, David Miller and Hugh Price, um, and you can blame uh, Hugh for the acronym, um, is basically uh, the following argument. This says, well, just look at quantum field theory and assume that the ontology is in space-time, which is where, where I'm trying to go to. Um, what matters in quantum field theory is the classical action. And any two experiments that have basically the same classical action are going to have the same correlations. Now, what's the action? The action is this space-time integral of this nice local quantity called Lagrangian density. And that's actually a pretty good candidate for what might be available. It's local. It's actually uh, has all the right symmetries. Um, it has, uh, it's going to give you this, this for free. But uh, whether or not that's the beable we're looking for, you can still strongly motivate this, this hypothesis that if you have two experiments that are action dual in that you can take the Lagrangian density of one experiment and do some space-time transformation to map it onto the Lagrangian density of a, a different experiment, that you would expect that the ontology would, would kind of map as well. Any beables would also have, have that same map. And you've already seen one application of this with the mirror example, and that's, that's basically what it is. You take any time you have a one-particle story, uh, preparation, transformation, measurement, um, if you have an all-at-once account that gives you the joint probabilities between M1 and M2, you can just basically use fish and time reverse basically everything on x greater than zero here on the right and build a two-particle entangled 
uh, uh, experiment that would have the same Lagrangian density everywhere, right? Because you're taking, assuming it's time symmetric, take the Lagrangian density here, flip it up to here, you have the same action, the same quantum field theory tells us we have to have the same correlations. Uh, only now the correlations are between M1 and M2 up here rather than M1 and M2 down here. Uh, so this, you already saw a version of this in, in Hughes' talk. <coughs> now, I, we have to encode different entangled states. So where does that encoding happen? That's going to happen at this point. Uh, different uh, local correlations are going to correspond to different intermediate transformations here. Uh, we'll, again, get in a little more detail. Um, the, again, this weird difference, that the fact that we are agents and we can control the inputs to this M1, but we can't control the outputs from that M1, means that we can signal in this case, but we can't signal in this case, as, as you talked about. So I, I won't go into that in more detail, except we wrote, uh, he didn't mention the other paper we wrote on this last summer. Um, that'll be published at some point soon um, as well. Okay, so the goal then is to come up with specific one particle all at once models where we look at the history, get the right probabilities, and then we can just use FISH to build a specific entanglement model. So you might think, well, there are lots of one particle explanations, but actually if you start to look at them, they either fail on the time symmetry front where there's like a dynamic collapse or something that happens up here that doesn't happen down here, or uh, it's, um, well, that's usually what goes wrong. So uh, can we find an account that gives us the right probabilities of even just one part? And the one that I've, I've gravitated to that I quite <coughs> like um, was proposed by, by Larry Shulman uh, originally back in the 90s, but he has a new paper on this. You may know him from his Path Integral book, or he was one of the guys that worked out how the Path Integral for spin worked, but he's also uh, interested in foundations. And he came up with this, this simple toy model where he said, okay, suppose a spin one half particle really has a vector in the direction you measure. You measure spin up, it really has some vector pointing up. You measure spin right, it really has some vector pointing right. And every time you make a measurement, that's a boundary condition. <clears throat> now, that's kind of weird because then you make a measurement at one time in one direction, a measurement at another time in another direction, and uh, the spin vector has changed. Well, it could change with the magnetic field, sure, but what if there are no fields? How does it get from... Uh, ti to ti theory. So he proposed that the what uh, between two measurements you could have just some anomalous rotation of this vector. It could just rotate by some angle beta, and he just uh, had an ansatz that said, okay, what if this is the probability distribution, the joint probability of the whole history? Now, the probability that you're going to have a rotation of beta from uh, ti to, uh, tf. Now, this gamma has to be some very very small parameter. I'll mention that in a sec. But basically, uh, he said this actually leads to the Born rule. Now, as simple as this is, that's, that's not obviously the Born rule. So let me tell you how, how you get the Born rule from this thing. So basically, what you're looking for is a bunch of possible rotations. But all that matters, as far as the probability goes, is the net rotation of the angle beta. The so where you get the Born rule out of this is you say, OK, I, I'm going to prepare this. I can do that for, for certain. And what I'm going to do up here is I'm going to make a measurement on the stern like apparatus, say on this axis. And I know I'm going to get the red outcome or the green outcome, but, but I don't know which. <clears throat> so you say, well, it could rotate by beta of 0.4 pi to get to the red outcome, or it could rotate by beta of 0.6 pi to get to, to the green outcome. But there are more possibilities as well because, uh, so his is this Lorentzian here, and you could get to the red outcome with this rotation, that probability, or the green outcome with this rotation. But this is not exponential. This is one of these long tail distributions. And because you also need to consider the case where you wrap around once and wrap around twice, he showed that if you sum the series, you get the Born rule. And so this is kind of this really neat uh, derivation of the Born rule. The nice thing about it is it's an all at once account. You look at the whole history, you get a beta, and you can assign it a probability, a joint probability all at once, and you get out the right correlations between these two possible outcomes. <coughs> uh, you only get the Born rule in the limit that gamma goes to zero exactly. And gamma can't go to zero exactly, or this blows up. So uh, there's actually room for some prediction of slight variation from the Born rule if we knew what if we knew what gamma was. But I'll, I'll leave that uh, that aside for now. So this is a, the story we want. This is a, a one particle uh, model that explicitly tells you what's happening in between measurements for one particle. Uh, so now you just apply fish. We take this one particle model, flip this up. 
And uh, Alice is choosing one measurement angle here. Bob's choosing another measurement angle here. Um, we have a local, the simplest case is you just enforce local continuity, where whatever uh, spin direction here is the same as the spin direction here. That's all the entanglement has to do is make sure it's continuous. And now, instead of two possible outcomes, you have four, right? You have four pairs of joint outcomes, red, 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 green, green, red, green, green. Um, but you get the same story. Now you have an anomalous rotation uh, where somewhere in between here, this vector has to rotate um, along this path. It's continuous here. And then continue to rotate along that path. And the probability is just given by his ansatz. And the net rotation gives you exactly what we see for uh, maximally entangled state. You get, uh, you have to divide by two more cases now because you have four possibilities, but you use the exact same math. You get exactly the same story and you violate the Bell inequality. You get explicitly uh, the maximal violations of the Bell inequality from this explicit model. This, it's a hidden variable model in that there are states here that you don't know what they are. Um, you don't know what uh, the state is here. Or you're just making sure when you prepare it that it's, it's the same left and right. Okay, let's, let's drill down here. Now that we have an explicit uh, Bell inequality violated model with hidden, explicit hidden variables and everything, we can zoom down and say, well, where exactly are we getting the weirdness? The weirdness comes about, uh, if you, so if you remember, think of this as a hidden variable here. The distribution over possible hidden variables depends on the settings. <coughs> Not just the outcomes, but the settings. So imagine the settings are both in the z-axis, okay? Now, it's overwhelmingly probable you either get, in this case, uh, both up or both down. And that means it's overwhelmingly probable that the hidden state here is either straight up or straight down, because you need no rotation. They're both up, you don't need a rotation. That's the maximum probable case. They're both down, you don't need a rotation. As soon as I learn what the settings are both up, I can update my knowledge of the hidden variables right here. And I can say, ah, they're definitely up or down. But if I knew that this measurement was z and this one was x, I would come to a different conclusion about the possibility space of the hidden variables here. So see what's happening. I'm learning about the measurement setting, and I'm updating my probabilistic assessment of what these distribution of hidden variables might be, which is explicitly forbidden in any of these accounts. And in all the accounts, you have some distribution of hidden variables that has to be independent of your settings. And so that is explicitly where you're getting the violation of statistical independence. The different settings correspond to a different distribution of hidden variables right at this point. <clears throat> the experimenter decisions are still free. They're coming from outside the system of interest. We're not discussing Alice and Bob. However, they choose a random coin flip or some logical thought process. Uh, however they choose it, it's, that's a free choice as far as this is concerned. Um, and uh, here we have now an explicit, if, if the question is show me a model, uh, this maybe isn't a very good explanation yet, but it's, it's at least an explicit model where you can drill down and ask specific questions about what's happening, uh, what's happening between measurements, even in cases that violate the Bell inequality. Um, it's, there are some questions certainly raised by this that uh, I, I still want to know the answers to. Um, and I want to generalize this. I don't just want um, one type of entangled state. There's a whole range of entangled states we need to be able to talk about. And so uh, to that extent, and to the extent that I want to build all this from a Lagrangian, uh, I set about trying to build this, this toy Lagrangian for, for spin one half systems. Basically abstract away the spatial degrees of freedom and come up with a Lagrangian that uh, not only uh, could hopefully account for what I just showed you, but also would ideally have some natural set of hidden variables that might, be, might emerge from the map. So I'll briefly outline uh, what I've been working on as far as this goes. I've, kicking and screaming, been dragged to the notion that the best way to do this is with, with quaternions. Uh, so if all you're trying to do is encode a spin one half state, um, it actually turns out to be far more natural. This is one possible mapping of a, a qubit to a quaternion. If you don't know what quaternions are, basically what you need to know is there are three um, different imaginary components, i, j, and k and the order of multiplication matters. Um, and that one nice thing about these things is that the unit quaternions, anyway, have the same structure as qubits. And of course, the unit quaternion is exactly what you get if you map the normalization condition onto this, onto this state. So basically, my ontology is 
The spin state consists of uh, a unit uh, quaternion, and uh, that has three free parameters in it. So the qubits normally are thought to have two free parameters because normally you're ignoring the global phase. That if you were ever going to get this spatial story to work, there is no possible way you can ignore the global phase. I mean, the global phase isn't really even quite hidden. You can measure the Berry phase. You can measure a phase in the of bohm experiments. Um, and the way you do it in standard story is by going into configuration space, which is not available to us. The only possible way we're ever going to get all the predictions of quantum mechanics out is to treat that global phase as a real hidden variable. And lots of people have done this. It's the most obvious hidden variable waiting in the math. It's in the math. It's already in, in the math of qubits uh, to keep track of. So I am going to keep track of the, the global phase. And we'll see how important it is. Um, so if you multiply your state by, by global phase here, that turns out to be equivalent under this mapping to multiply Q to, on the left, which is important, by E to the quaternionic I times L. Um, why not J or K? We'll, we'll address that. We'll address that in a second. Okay, <clears throat> if phase is important, the very first place the phase gets thrown out in standard quantum mechanics is we ignore the relativistic rest mass. Uh, even in the Schrodinger equation, if you take that mass into account, you get this oscillation at the Compton frequency for an electron that's like 10 to the 21 hertz. Um, but if you keep this phase in, then this is the sort of state we're looking for. Now, so what Lagrangian is going to give you, give you those states as, as sort of special solutions? It turns out that I decided to go to a second order uh, Lagrangian, uh, not just because of time symmetry, mm -hmm. but also because of, um, also because of, uh, it's not rich enough for entanglement. Just having one phase as a hidden variable turns out to not quite be enough uh, hidden variables to encode all the possible entangled states there are for two qubits. So um, I basically started with the simplest thing I could come up with, uh, this Lagrange, a harmonic oscillator Lagrangian, which is always, always a good starting point. Uh, this omega naught, the rest mass shows up in here. And um, this Lagrangian uh, has all sorts of interesting features. So let's, um, let's talk about the classical limit really quickly. First of all, one of the classical solutions, uh, the main classical solutions look like this, where V is any unit vector on the three vector so it could be i, it could be j, it could be k, it could be anything. And so remember I said that one was i, why not j or k? It turns out those correspond to different mappings between, um, <coughs> between the quantum state and, and the quaternion. So it turns out there are lots and lots of quaternions that map to the same quantum state, which makes sense because in a second order differential equation, you need not only q, but q dot to define everything. So you have a lot more variables. There's this new interesting natural hidden variable it's a unit three vector, and uh, that, that will briefly come in in a minute. I'm not going to talk about magnetic fields, but there is a very natural extension. You can add a magnetic field and rotate this however you want. It matches Schrodinger polydynamics, and uh, if you really want to go through the gory details, there's, there's that. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing that came out of this model that uh, struck me right away was that there, these are not the only solutions. These are the solutions that map to a quantum state but there are these other weird solutions that I didn't want because I didn't map to a quantum state. And I discovered that I could eliminate them with this, this constraint. You just force the Lagrangian to always be zero. And I'd seen this before it pop up a couple times, and I started to really think about it. And, uh, well, just take a look. See what happens if you're looking at L equals zero histories in, in any space. So we suppose you have a Lagrangian zero history that also solves the classical equation of motion, which is what we just had. Um, now, what is uh, L? L is the, um, if you integrate L, you get the action. So say we have a history where L is zero and it's a classical solution. The action is extreme. Well, S is zero for sure. And because the variation of S is zero, all the neighboring, all the closely neighboring histories also have a zero action. And so they could be other L equals zero histories. You could have a big cluster of a bunch of L equals zero histories right near the classical equations of motion. On the other hand, suppose you add a different L equals zero history that didn't solve the classical equation of motion. Now, um, when you vary this, S is zero for the red line, but you start to vary it, and you have a non-zero action history. So there's no way any of these are L equals zero histories. So if you're going to find a big cluster 
of Alcazar histories are going to be clustered around the classical equation of motion, which is quite interesting to me because you, now you have a bunch of possibilities. The most, most of them are clustered around the Euler-Lagrange equations where the action is extremized. And by the way, nobody quite knows why, why that works. So this would be an answer. So basically, you would find these big clusters of O equals zero solutions near the uh, classical equations of motion, but you wouldn't be limited to them. You could have uh, L equals not, uh, L equals zero solutions that, that have anomalies. Remember what we're looking for. So we're looking for these weird rotations that don't correspond to any dynamical equation. <clears throat> so this is what happens if you try to build a... Uh, uh, st a story out of just giving up on classical physics and going to this condition. Um, and here's, here's the uh, citation for that. Um, first of all, it's a space-time local constraint. You can do it with Lagrangian densities as well. It's this weird intermediate step between classical physics and the path integral. The path integral, you consider all histories. Uh, the, the classical physics, you only consider the classical histories. Now we're sort of in this interesting intermediate Step. It's not quite as crazy as the path interval. Um, and what you can do, you can say, well, we have all these possibilities now. So what do we do in StatMech? We have lots of possibilities. We assign them each an equal a priori probability. Um, if you did that here and there weren't any boundary constraints, you would just say, well, my best guess is it's going to be the classical equations of motion. That's where most of the L equals zero histories are clustered. But if you put boundary constraints on and say the initial state is spin up, and the final state has been sideways, and there is no classical solution, there are L equals zero solutions. And so you can explicitly show that to this Lagrangian, if you want an anomalous rotation that doesn't follow any particular dynamic equation, there are L equals zero solutions that will do that. So now there is at least a mechanism to get these weird rotations that, that Shulman postulate. <clears throat> and you go through the math, and it turns out that uh, if for a given rotation of the, of the spin state, delta theta, you get a spread of the global phase. Remember I said this important hidden variable. So the global phase somehow is linked to how far you spread, how far you anomalously rotate. Um, <clears throat> gamma in this case is a small parameter talking about how tightly clustered the L equals zero solutions are around the classical solution, which I still need a proper measure to evaluate, but there's hope of evaluating it. This thing is, you, rec you need to have an uncertainty in the measurement time. But that's OK, because these are all energy measurements. So you automatically get an uncertainty energy time. But this is basically a big constant. And then you say, well, suppose your external constraints fix the global phase. And I can give you an argument why that might happen. But if you just suppose it, um, now your probability of a phase match goes like the inverse of this. Uh, because having a lot of possible phases in your solution, you're going to be very unlikely to have a phase match. But if delta alpha is small and all the phases line up, you're very, very probable to have a phase match. And that is uh, my most exciting result to date, that this Shulman's ansatz of having this particular distribution for the net rotation, and this is the net rotation of a spin state, happens to follow exactly what you need to to get the board rule. And there's even hope of figuring out what, what gamma is and figuring out by what tiny amount the Born rule might be, uh, might be violated. So that is uh, now a little more explanatory version of the first retrocausal model I showed you. Um, but uh, I think I do have just enough time to show you one more cool extension of this, uh, motivated by um, a conversation I had with Matt Leifer last summer. Uh, or maybe he'll talk about this in a couple days, what he was trying to do. Um, but by talking to him, I, I realized that this vector v I had is exactly the hidden variable I need to do uh, a retrocausal account of stabilizer circuits yeah. in general. So stabilizer circuits, basically a <laughs> qubit only has six states. It's, it's like the Speckens Fine model. You got z plus z minus z plus x minus f plus y minus y. And so basically, as a little simple model, you have two, uh, you have a spin state vector, one of those six states, and then you have, you just force this hidden vector to be perpendicular to it. So there are four more possibilities for the hidden vector v, and that's 24 ontic states. And what v is, it's the axis of rotation for this anomaly. So if you have an anomalous rotation between measurements, that uh, rotates around the v axis. And then you only need 90 degree anomalies in the stabilizer model. You don't have to worry about intermediate models. So you just assign some, prob some small probability 
for any history that has some 90 degree anomaly rotation. And uh, you do the usual boundaries. You constrain the spin state everywhere with both preparation and measurement. So for something like this, where I've moved time to the right now, uh, where you prepare a spin plus x, and you measure on the y-axis as a plus or minus y, this is a boundary constraint, right? This is constraining the spin state to be in plus y or minus y. And this is a boundary constraint, constraining it to be in plus x. The only solutions are these non-classical uh, rotations. And so you can deduce, well, anomaly must occur. There are just as many that rotate one way as the other way. So you deduce the probabilities from, from the model. And you can also deduce the value, the, if it's rotating from x to y, it's rotating around the z-axis. You now know what the, what the hidden variable was. Uh, the application of this I wanted to show you was, um, requires the full stabilizer formalism. So you need these single qubit gates, which are pretty straightforward because the state space is so similar to ordinary quantum mechanics. But you also need uh, controlled knot gates. And this is the tricky one because these generate entangled states, which we don't have in this story. Everything is space-time local. So for example, if you put in a minus x and a plus z, quantum mechanics tells you you get this entangled state, but I can't use that. That's, that's not OK. So uh, what, what's going on? Well, in, in Speck and Stoy model, basically, the entangled states are correlations between, you know the correlation between this output and this output. You don't know the particular values. You just know they're correlated. And so you generate a table. Uh, my grad student, uh, Nick Murphy, is, is here, who helped me, uh, helped me uh, build all these correlations. There's actually one nice equation that generates all these entangled states. But let's just take this case. If you put in a minus x up here and a plus z here, this tells you how these top right and bottom right uh, spin vectors are correlated. So if you have a plus x on top, you have to have a minus x on the bottom, and, and so on. There's one nice rule. And then there, there are 16 of these, actually, that um, are all the entangled states you can make. <coughs> uh, given that you have a table that works to the right, you also have it uh, from left to right. The same rules could work from right to left, and so you have to account for that possibility. But the, because V gets correlated here as well, it's actually very unlikely that it does run the other way, and we're not going to need to use that for the example I want to show, which is um, the GHZ uh, argument. So Merman has this uh, arguably better than Bell argument for non-locality, or at least uh, specifically it's an argument against the particles carrying hidden instructions. <laughs> and it doesn't require probabilities, which is why it's arguably better. And you just build this GHZ state with these two C not gates <coughs> and these inputs. And this GHZ state um, has this really weird feature where there are these four uh, seemingly incompatible measurements. Mm -hmm. you, you can choose to measure this in the x-axis, this in the y, and this in the y. And then you find an odd number of plus outcomes and an even number of minus. And actually, it doesn't matter where you put the x. As long as you have one x and two y's, you get, uh, you get this result. If you, though, measure all x's, you get the opposite result. You get an even number of pluses. And you can quickly show there's no way to account for this in terms of the local uh, instructions telling the gates what to do. Um, but that assumes that the instructions don't depend on the set. And remember, that's the key. You know, different, different settings are going to lead to different hidden variables. So let's see how it works in my model. So uh, here we go, uh, the relevant parts of the table we need here. What we're looking for are no anomaly solutions. There are, in fact, no anomaly solutions here. We don't need any anomalous rotations. You just uh, look at this table. And you say, OK, well, let's look at this first C naught. So this is minus x plus z. This is the one we looked at before. Uh, that means a and b are correlated. And they're all six of these cases. But they're not all possible, because here you're measuring this in the x direction. So if you're, there's no anomaly, this has to be aligned at plus x and minus x. right? Otherwise, there would have to be an anomaly. So that would be unlikely by epsilon. So you say, well, a has to be either plus x or minus x. And therefore, b has to be either the opposite one, you can see here at the bottom. And then you say, well, if b is minus x, that's the top case, now this looks just like this, minus x plus z, and you deduce the correlation between c and d. And now you can see if these are both y, it has to be either plus y. They both have to be plus, right? This is plus plus, or they both have to be minus, or this case. And you get exactly what we see. We get four cases, they're all equally likely, and they have an odd number of pluses. On the other hand, if you do this, xxx, now you're a different part of the table. Well, the first part is exactly the same. But now, um, when these go into these gates, 
these C and D are for, be forced to a boundary condition, right? Future boundary condition are forced to align with X. So now instead of the Y column, we use the X column. And so this, the hidden states here at C and D are aligned with X, not aligned with Y. And sure enough, you get an even number of pluses. So this, again, exactly what, uh, what we see. And so it's not impossible, but the key is that the hidden state at C and D down here is a spin state in the X direction. And you can, you can zoom in and see exactly what's going on with these models. In this case, it's aligned in the Y direction. And why is it aligned differently? Because this future boundary constraint, which is set by the external experimenter settings, is constraining the, um, the whole history all at once. And you get out uh, explicit, uh, explicitly what we see for, for GHC. GH. <coughs> OK, well, there was a whirlwind tour of uh, a bunch of specific retrocausal models. And uh, the main message that I want to leave you with is that it, it's not crazy to have space-time local vehicles. It, it is plausible. And given how fantastically important uh, this it, how, how wonderful for physics it would be to have vehicles that live in space time. Uh, I certainly think uh, it, it needs some attention. Um, well, what's quantum mechanics then? Why does quantum mechanics live in this crazy huge configuration space? And basically, it's because we're not Bayesian updating when we learn about the setup. Um, we, what the quantum state is, it's encoding uh, possibilities for all future measurements, right? No matter what we do, it's, you can find the answer in the quantum state. But out there in the future, for every experiment, all future measurements do not happen. For every experiment, there is one measurement waiting in the future for that experiment to encounter. And as soon as you update, so basically what the quantum state corresponds to is a bunch of space-time beables, a probably the distribution over them, one distribution for each future geometry. And what quantum mechanics never does is it never then updates the state when you learn the geometry. And all the stories I gave you, when you learn the geometry, that suddenly now vastly constrains your, your description of reality. And you update, and then what you're left with is a probability distribution over space-time histories. So that updating step is what's, what's missing, and that's why the wave function is so big. That's why more particles has a bigger wave function, because now there are more future geometries. Right? You add another particle, there are more possible future geometries, you need a bigger wave function. Uh, I think the way to do this is this Lagrangian style analysis. That's all the key pieces. It's naturally this all at once story of a multi boundary problem. You naturally get lots of possible histories, and uh, you naturally get joint probabilities out of it, out of which ideally, uh, or uh, the reason that there's joint that probabilities at all, ideally, is you don't know which microhistory it is, but there really is one history in space time that's sort of our job to to whittle down as we do an experiment. And uh, a last thought I'll leave you with is that if, if you don't like this story, um, maybe, maybe we're being a little too anthropocentric about the universe. I mean, think about who we are. We, we're people who know the past and we don't know the future. It's very useful for us to have a story that will give a, a past, predict an output. And that's extremely useful. We shouldn't back away from that. That's what we need. But we don't have to have a universe that works that way, right? We could have a universe that solves itself all at once as a big, giant boundary condition problem. And uh, by imposing the way we want to solve problems on the way we think the universe works, uh, we may be missing out on exactly what we need to link quantum mechanics and relativity. Thanks.